Hello everyone, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Lin Guo from uh, Chongqing, China, Southwest Hospital. Uh, this is uh, the Asia uh, Novel Seminar. And uh, we have already two sessions about uh, severe virus knee and valgus knee. So this is the third session. In each episode, we invited uh, students from all over the world uh, who have great experience and big volume of total knee replacement to join this uh, discussion. So it is my honor to be the moderator of uh, this session. Uh, for this session, we are going to discuss about uh, uh, flexum deformity, uh, total knee replacement. So uh, first, I want to invite the president of Asia, Dr. Nicholas, to introduce uh, all the speakers for us today. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. Thank you, Professor Lingo. Um, welcome to the Asia uh, Novel Seminar. This is the, uh, as what mentioned by Professor Linguo, this is the third session after the two extremely successful sessions uh, on the technique how to deal with the virus in valgus knees. And today's topic is also very important on how to deal with uh, knee flexions contractures. And it is my distinct honor uh, to introduce our world-renowned speakers, uh, my three uh, very good friends. Uh, first, is, uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Sanjeev Maria, who happens to be the past president of Asia. And he is the master guru of arthroplasty from India. And uh, after that, we have uh, Professor Sami Tarabichi, uh, my close friend from Dubai, who is the founder of the ICJR Middle East. And he has also run uh, some successful sessions in the past eight years. And last but not least, as um, we know, we have the very handsome Professor Sebastian Perret, uh, who currently splits his time between Marseille in France and also in Abu Dhabi and uh, Uni Emirate Arab. So he's currently involved in robotic assisted surgery research and has published more than 300 papers and chapters in the textbooks on the topic of hip and knee arthroplasty. So uh, please join uh, us is with a warm welcome uh, to all our distinguished uh, faculty and hosts. And I will hand over to the, uh, my good friend, uh, Professor Lingo. Please, uh, Professor Lingo. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. It's a really good honor uh, for me to uh, have all, all of you here. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, uh, I know that uh, uh, Dr. Parrot is uh, from France, and I was also a fellow of uh, Dr. Jean-Louis Briard. Now, he has mentioned me about you several times that you are very kind and very smart, and you are a good knee surgeon as well as a good sports medicine surgeon. So. Uh, uh, Jean-Louis uh, Briard I want to say hello to you because he knows uh, that I will be hosting this, uh, this session. And uh, for Dr. Maya, we have met in Shanghai and uh, we all know that Dr. Maya is a uh, top surgeon of, uh, from India that who can do all kinds of uh, difficult cases. And uh, each Indian surgeon is good at uh, difficult cases and uh, is a master of uh, tough cases. And he is the master of all the masters. So welcome Dr. Maya. And uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Tarabich from uh, Middle East. Uh, this is uh, our first time to meet, but I want to uh, say it is my great honor to be here, and uh, we, we look forward to in the future we have more meetings together. Uh, next, uh, I will invite uh, Professor Maya from uh, India to share his uh, difficult cases of uh, flex and deformity. We all know that uh, there are plenty of uh, tough cases in India and uh, Dr. Maya is uh, the master of the, uh, all the masters who can do difficult cases in India. So please, Dr. Maya, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Go. I shall talk about a specific thing here. I'll be going to talk about a fused knee inflection. And uh, you, you get different type of contractures. Contracture in uh, knee replacement is a huge topic. But a stiff knee and a fused knee is what I will be talking about. So let's see the technicalities in dealing with this. So what is actually a stiff knee? A stiff knee is one which has less than 50 degrees of arc of motion. So 10 to 60 or 30 to 80 like that. It's an arc of motion. 
and whenever you are dealing with these you have to be prepared for difficult process like you are going to be doing a revision what are the usual reasons for lack of motion or contractures it could be due to previous surgery and adherent scar previous injury and adherent scars previous infection and adherent scars you can look at this knee and you can understand this is going to create difficulty in the range of movement what are the other pathologies which lead to loss of motion there could be inflammatory arthritis commonest is rheumatoid then ankylosing psoriatic now these are the inflammatory situations which are fairly well addressed today then the ones which are more dangerous and one has to be careful are like reflex sympathetic dystrophy or the complex syndrome the neuromuscular disorders and like cerebral palsy and sometimes you may even find a patient with a worn out knee in a flexed fixed attitude due to severe pain so what do you do and how do you plan pre operatively when you have a patient who has arthritic knee but cannot straighten it you must understand what can be the pathology if you know the problem only then you will know the solution you do not try to just look at the patient and jump in to replace it you should have done good pre operative planning understand where is the problem the usual pathological anatomy has short and tight muscles and ligaments there may be fibrosis of the quadriceps muscle there may be fibrosis inside or outside of the joint itself and there may be bony blocks may have formed inside or outside of the joint for various reasons so we must know what is causing this kind of a stiff or a fixed flexion deformity so before you start the surgery you must be careful and make some recording on the paper young surgeons can get excited very keen to go in and put a beautiful knee and in a hurry and excitement fail to record some of these things which includes what was the range of motion before you started the operation so basis of this is what you will promise to the patient are there scars are there contractures is it a pure flexion or is it along with valgus usually it is with valgus very rarely with the varus also how is the blood circulation so crucial to feel the ankle vessels how are the sensations in the leg how is the motor function that is before the surgery and this must be documented because sometimes there may be these problems before you operate however after the surgery you may get blamed for one of these things which you had not noted not only noticed but also noted afterwards so notice the problem and note the problem on paper so that you are safe patient's desire and ability to cooperate is extremely important in these kind of situations because rehabilitation is usually more vigorous than the normal knee replacement radiologically the normal x rays have to be taken ap lateral skyline in some instances like this skyline won't be possible here ct scan is very helpful scanogram is very helpful you must be able to if possible see if you can see the alignment again you cannot really get a straight even scanogram here but what is important is to see if there is any bone loss what does the quality of bone look like what kind of a hold are you going to find in the bone with your implants and also importantly is there any hardware already inside like plates or screws or staples rarely nails and in which case be prepared to remove these and have appropriate equipment to remove all these when you go in to do this you must have the full range of knee replacement equipment whether it is retaining or sacrificing type of knee a constraint knee and you must do not stuff the indication into the implant 
the implant should be used as per the problem so you do not keep one implant and then try to fit your problem into that implant i always do cruciate retaining but when i go in there is no cruciate ligament it's all gone so you can't do that so you must have everything handy so the usual anesthesia and before you start look in red examination under anesthesia is extremely important because you will be pleasantly happily surprised that many times half the deformity is due to muscle spasm after anesthesia when you straighten the leg your job becomes much easier so but that doesn't mean that you prepare to work on that premise you prepare to work on the worst case scenario but this happens usually the spasm goes look for all the incisions and you have to decide which incision you will use usually the lateral most keeping in mind the blood supply comes from the median side inside when you go you use parapetalar incision and this is a compromised situation therefore the skin incision there should be no undermining the knife should not be moved repeatedly it should preferably be one simple clean cut down to bone after that you mobilize the quadriceps mechanism on both sides you will find that the extensor mechanism is stuck to the bone right on the lower femur and upper tibia so you have to as a first take a diathermy or cautery and recreate the parapetalar gutters which will after your surgery let the knee flex and extend if the soft tissue is stuck to the bone there will be no movement later on in some cases this patella is stuck to the bone of the lower femoral condyle and here you can see the ankylos patella has been shaved off from the top of the lateral femoral condyle now the trick here is to take a nice thick piece from the lateral femoral condyle otherwise you will have problems if you take a thin patella you will not be able to resurface the patella so you need to take a good chunk of bone when you are releasing the patella from that after you have done that the next thing you have to be careful about is you have to get the flexion back to get the flexion back the ideal thing to do is to use the small z lengthenings in the rectus as seen in this diagram it was very difficult to take pictures of this on on the table because this is so small it doesn't show nicely so a diagram shows that you make small z lengthenings in the rectus or the quadriceps central part of the quadriceps other thing you can do is a quadriceps snip that is on the parapetalar incision you go up at the end laterally the vy turn down is really not the best thing because the rehab is very difficult and in the rehab you end up with an extensor lag that makes the patient's gait very uncomfortable tubercle osteotomy is not bad provided performed properly and it is a big of big chunk of bone almost 7 and a half to 8 cm long osteotomy on the anterior part taking the tubercle and then rewiring it back just putting screws may not be enough after doing an osteotomy these are separate chapters but you have to know the young colleagues have to know what are the possibilities and if you are doing something then you learn that particular thing separately now if the bone is fused like the case we are dealing with we need to break this fusion how do we do that well we need to create or recreate the joint line and to recreate the joint line we need to know where is the joint line the joint line you need to find from the epicondyles of the femur or from upper end of the tibia these are the easiest landmarks that you can find it is from the lateral epicondyle 2.5 cm below and from the medial epicondyle it is 3 cm below and it is 1.5 cm above the fibular head now here lies the importance of having an image intensifier in your ot if your ot is sharing it with another ot make sure you have it because this can sometimes help you 
put a thin k wire or guide wire and see where you are and how far you are you can put one guide wire into the one of the epicondyles take a metal scale and measure it with another one under image intensifier that is how you must look for the joint line and friends joint line is extremely important to get a good quality result in knee replacement so soft tissue balance gap balance and joint line have always got to be kept in mind in any type of replacement surgery so when you are exposing you basically need to avert the patella in these cases where you must be careful that you do not avulse the patellar ligament to do that you must put a patella a pin into the patellar ligament into the tibia not only it stops avulsion but if you are putting too much force you will get an indicator and you can stop while you are doing that you release nicely medially and externally rotate the tibia when you will externally rotate the tibia the pressure and stress on the patellar ligament will reduce slowly with a diathermy preferably remove the menisci and create a nice long soft tissue sleeve from the femoral side down to the tibia there is no problem here because this is going to go back and it is going to take a nice position later on in these cases you don't have to worry if you are still not able to release that is the time you have to think of making either pike resting or release of the itb iliotibial band lateral collateral ligament and very rarely in the last the popliteus tendon these days you rarely find a situation where you need to go for the gastrocnemia release but that is the extreme end so then you use the jigs for the tibia extra medullary jig is usually better you make a 6 to 10 mm cut and a posterior slope usually 3 to 5 mm is, degrees is enough if you have the other side absolutely healthy you can make measurements on that side and reproduce on this side otherwise for default 5 6 degrees of valgus on the knee on the femur and 3 to 5 degrees of posterior slope let me make a note here in these kind of cases it's quite helpful to use the computer assisted surgery so you must be aware how to use it you may not need to use it every day but in these difficult situations it's quite helpful as i said on the femoral side you make a similar cut but on the femoral side it is better to use an intramedullary jig unless you, there is some obstruction to that in which case again computer obstruction like a plate or a nail something which you can't remove or which you don't want to remove and just want to let it lie there and you cannot put a rod inside there are two rods one is a long rod other is a short rod and if there is a, a, a plate or a nail coming right down you can't use either of the rods so once you have made the distal and the cut on the posterior part of the femur you can use a spacer block to see that you have got both the flexion and extension gaps okay now when you put the trials or these and you find you are tight laterally and you have done everything else then you may need a lateral head gastrocnemic release very rare nowadays sometimes you can even do a lateral femoral epicondyle osteotomy and let it fall down as from france professor briard has been talking about if extension is difficult you can go back and cut the posterior capsule if you are not getting flexion you go and do some more pie resting or z lengthening in the rectus femoris if the flexion gap is more that but still less than 6 to 8 mm you can use a cruciate sacrificing knee if it is beyond that then you use a varus valgus constrained knee so the finally you cement the implants in case of when there is valgus that you have corrected you must leave the post operative don't straighten the full knee in the recovery let it be flexed 15 to 20 degrees so that the nerve is not immediately stretched even when you are cementing don't put too much force in extension it is better in these cases where there is severe flexion and severe valgus if you are a person who uses one cement to do both the implants this is not the case to do it 
in this you do one side at a time otherwise you are more likely to not if you are beyond 40 degrees of deflection or valgus you are likely to get a peroneal nerve injury if you put both together you are tempted to straighten it and to straighten it you are going to stretch the nerve badly then you must check the patellar tracking which patella has been cemented with a no thumb technique which is a standard process flex and extend and patella should run smoothly again it's very rare that you need to do a lateral patella release and of course these are the x rays it's not a bad idea to take these on the table but otherwise you can take them later post operatively it's up to you if you want to use a drain but we immediately if the peroneal nerve is not showing any symptoms immediately start the same day using a cpm machine we don't usually use a cpm machine for knee replacements for these difficult situations we do use it also because in these cases the muscles have not been going through full exercise and drain and second we want to restrict the amount of flexion that we are around in the beginning we if there is any indication of a uh, nerve uh, being involved then put a splint at about 30 degrees or 40 degrees or simply keep the knee in flexion on a pillow to that kind if all is well then you can ambulate the same evening or next day but the complications final slide can be that the tibial tubercle can get ever evolved that's a difficult situation you may get bad flexion gaps if you are not able to control it at all you might even have to consider a, a rotating hinge or whatever kind of a hinged implant that's not a happy situation but you have to be ready if it if you are not able to balance it it's very embarrassing if a knee dislocates today it should not happen you should look out for bone or ligament loss ligaments cruciates doesn't matter because you can substitute with implants but if you are going to hit the collaterals then you have to be careful which implant to use medial collateral alone partial injury you can use varus valgus constraint but if both sides are badly damaged or you are not able to retreat then again you are going towards hinged then in these cases loss of range of movement is known and the wound healing can be a problem because skin can be quite unhealthy at times but the important thing is even the most educated patient educated himself and educated by the surgeon expects a normal knee but you must tell them you must write it you must document that at the most 70 to 80 degrees is what i expect and that is good more than that is your good luck less than that is possible thank you that's all i have to say Thank you very much, uh, Doctor uh, Nicholas. Would you uh, give uh, for one one question for Doctor Maya, Maya? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Goldi. Yeah, uh, Professor Maria just told us. Thank you very much for your uh, nice presentations. Um, but I would maybe I would like to ask you. I mean, uh, for the young surgeons when they face this kind of problem, of course they ask now is how far can you cut? the distal femur because it's a point that sometimes though that you cut two four millimeters what is your landmark how far can you go to release and to have this uh, cut of the distal femur to make it straight please well ideally we normally take eight to ten millimeters but the, the worst case scenario don't go beyond the attachment of the uh, the the collateral ligaments because once you do that you are creating instability and right. but whatever you do uh, you got to be careful where you take the joint line if you are going too far proximally to try and correct uh, the extension uh, you might land up creating instability otherwise by shaving off one of the, the collateral ligaments so certainly well away from the attachment of the collaterals on the femoral side is what should be their mantra as for examples thank you okay thank you dr maya so uh, how much degree of uh, flexum residue flexum deformity can you accept uh, after uh, operating of the uh, fused uh, knee do you think uh, see if the fusion is due to rheumatoid or ankylosing then the soft tissues are usually going to behave well so 10 15 degrees is not a worry Okay. and that that will gradually and that is true for uh, rheumatoid anyway 
So that will gradually get all right. Even mm-hmm. if you have pressed it fully, we will still keep it at 15 degrees for a couple of weeks. After stitch removal, we'll slowly start stretching and it comes back. The worry is in a severe osteoarthritics don't usually have fused knee, but post-traumatic arthritics do have this problem. And they are the most difficult and the worst ones. And these are the ones which even in the most basic primary cases, stems must be used because this is where the loosening happens most easily in post-traumatic osteoarthritic, usually younger age group patients, sometimes older also. So in these, we don't want to accept any correction. And luckily in these, you don't find very severe deformities also. But I would not want to see or accept uh, Mm -hmm. deformities in an osteoarthritic knee on the table. But you may correct it, then put it back immediately to some flexion and gradually correct later. But on the table, you must get correction in osteoarthritis. Dr. Okay, Parabici, how much degree of flex deformity, residual flex deformity, can you accept before you're closing uh, the wound? I really don't accept any flexion contracture. I sometimes keep hearing some surgeons saying that uh, they will accept five degrees or 10 degrees. If you accept five degrees, it's going to come to you as a 15 degree. If you accept 10 degrees, it's going to come to you as 20 degrees. I don't accept any. Even so, if I have to go to, to constrain the implant, yeah. really don't accept it because if you accept it, you are bound to have worse. And if the patient walk with a flexion contraction, it's not going to be a happy customer. You know, you know I'd, I'd rather use a constrained implant. It's, it's a pure and simple. Mm-hmm. And let the patient extend the leg fully and let him have a normal activity rather than having flexion contraction. I accept zero. And in reality, I, I, in, in our Asian population, our Asian population tend to hyperextend. So if you ask me, what is your, your, your criteria? I, I don't even accept zero. I want it minus five. I want them to hyperextend five degree because Asian population have more lax ligament and more lax joint. And they don't like to, to you know, uh, stand. And, you know, look at the, the people around you. you. You see them all hyperextending, especially female when they stand up. So... My increment is minus three. In other words, I want them to be hyperextended about five degrees. It's a very good point. Uh, the first step to uh, get rid of uh, recurrence of uh, flex and deformity will be get full extension or maybe even hyperextension on the table. So it's a very good point. Uh, so to Dr. Parrett, uh, uh, how many degrees can you accept for uh, severe uh, flex and deformity? Uh, after the surgery, that you can make sure that uh, uh, your physical therapist can uh, recover the knee to full extension. So how many degree of uh, residue deformity can you accept? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, first for your invitation, second for your kind words, and uh, uh, I uh, return uh, the hello and salute to Jean-Louis Briard. He's a, um, a magic surgeon. We learn all a lot from him. Uh, his passion uh, uh, is incredible and uh, he's never giving up to make progress and that's really an example uh, uh, for all of us. Uh, to answer the question, I'm, I'm going to say that I'm very strict about the uh, extension at the end of the procedure. We know that the extension is crucial for the first phase of the gate, which is the ill strike phase. And if the patient doesn't have full extension, the, he or she will never walk properly. So it's very important to get that. I realize that it's very rare and very difficult to regain some extension after the surgery. So I would accept five degrees, 10 degrees, not more. And I do agree that we have to work on that intraoperatively. I share exactly the same point of view for the insertion of the medial collateral ligament as a natural landmark, and we can't go beyond this uh, line. We can't go up to this line. And uh, if you can't get the full extension while having done this important cut, that means that you have to play with the soft tissues. And the soft tissues, the hamstring, all the posterior structure of the knee are very important. And in rheumatoid cases, for example, there's not only a problem uh, intra-articular, but there's also a problem of the muscles around the knee, and sometimes it's very tricky. Yeah. Do you worry about uh, the uh, peroneal injury if you correct uh, 
uh, flattened deform deformity such as a 60 or 90 degrees of uh, deformity. So do you worry about uh, the parallel nerve? Yes, if, uh, if it's combined with a valgus, I'm going to be worried. If, it, if there's no valgus, I'm less worried, uh, but it's something that we have to consider. Um, there's a, a technique of the progressive uh, uh, recovery of the extension uh, post-operatively. However, you have to make sure that intraoperatively you can reach this extension. Otherwise, you will never get it back. And uh, this is the danger. And once again, for this very complex deformity, uh, particularly when it's fixed and absolutely not reducible, um, the, uh, um, the soft tissue are playing a big role and it's really outside of the knee and that should be considered. And I'm talking about the, the, the historic cases of rheumatoid arthritis, I'm talking about uh, hemophilia as well is providing this type of cases. And uh, it's, they, these are challenging cases. So don't start with these cases. And if you uh, have any doubt, ask for and seek for help because that's not going to be a success for the patient. If you go there and you don't have the habit of taking care of these cases, it's going to be very challenging for, for you and for the patient as well. Yeah, I think the, just now Dr. Maya has mentioned that uh, uh, flexum deformity plus valgus knee will be very challenging for peroneural injury protection. And uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Maya has uh, experience about how to protect the um, peroneural nerve during the surgery, right? Yes, I mean, uh, we have spoken and uh, a few things besides the precautions and the gradual extension, you have other ways of releasing the lateral side. And uh, uh, one of the ways is to do the, as we've been speaking of Pro Professor Briard here, one of the things is the lateral uh, epicondylar osteotomy and letting uh, the thing fall down and then giving it a new insertion. Once upon a time, we used to remove the fibula head, uh, you know, so that uh, when we used to get such severe deformities, we would release the, the nerve before we went into the real uh, operation. We would actually uh, uh, remove the fibula head, let the nerve get a little loose and then do the rest of the operation. Of recent, we have not found such severe deformities, fortunately, because of good trauma treatment or even good treatment for uh, uh, these uh, an inflammatory arthritis like uh, uh, rheumatoid or ankylosing, psoriasis or whatever. So now the deformities are very rare at that level that we are getting. But yes, we will always, whenever you see a valgus external, the triad, the, the valgus external rotation and flexion at the knee and you want to do, uh, do a, a knee replacement, as we just heard Professor Perrett saying, that's not the one for somebody who's not doing enough or who has enough of difficult cases. Just doing enough of simple cases is a different ball game. So these are the ones they have to be learned differently. These are not the ones that you pick up only from a book or from a manual. These are the ones which you learn from an experienced surgeon and see the experienced surgeon also getting into difficulty with extra caution. So yeah. yes. We think we all agree that uh, the soft tissue of patients are totally different from because they have different kind of disease. The patients uh, such as uh, rheumatoid arthritis, their soft tissue is very uh, stretchable. So maybe for rheumatoid arthritis, we can, uh, it is safe for us to keep some uh, radial deformity for them. And for patients like uh, hemophilia or post-traumatic patients, I think uh, they have more scar tissues than other patients. So maybe it's better for us to get uh, full extension during the surgery. Otherwise, it is very difficult to get uh, full extension uh, even if we have give enough uh, physical therapy for them. So do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It, it is true. And like we mentioned earlier, female is easier than male. A lot of time I find the osteoarthritis in an obese patient uh, who had a flexion contracture so difficult and challenging to correct. You have a lot of extensive thick fibrous tissue, you keep resecting it and they still don't, uh, don't uh, correct. So there is a definitely kind of a variance. Yes, you're right, rheumatoid, rheumatoid patients sometimes, you know, you do and yani some limited release or capsulectomy and everything tend to open. Female tend to be easier than male in, in correcting flexion contracture. 
Can so, I, uh, I would like to mention another point, please, uh, Lean. It's about, uh, it's not only about flexion contracture, it's for the correction of the big deformity, particularly for post-traumatic cases. You might have up to 15% of uh, uh, skin complication. So the skin is another issue and you have to be very careful when you reduce big deformities. So when you recover from uh, flexion contracture to full extension, most of the time it's helping for the skin vascularization. However, if you correct the big valgus deformity at the same time for post-traumatic cases, you might also have skin problems. So you have to be very cautious during the surgery. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think uh, skin co complication is very common for uh, post-traumatic knee. They have uh, maybe multiple scars and multiple incidents before. So uh, I think it is very important to pay attention to closing and the wound care. Uh, next, I want to uh, invite uh, Dr. Tarabichi to give us a talk about the management of flexion contracture in total knee replacement. So thank you, please, uh, Dr. Tarabichi. Thank you. Uh, flexion contracture uh, is a problem in total joint replacement. And what we're going to talk about is uh, what are the risk factors? You have to look for the risk factor and you have to anticipate it in certain group of people. And you have a treatment options and how to manage it while you're doing the surgery. Uh, there are people who are prone to have a flexion contracture, people who had rheumatoid arthritis, uh, male has higher incidence uh, than female, uh, females seem to be more flexible, and the incidence is probably four to one, and pre-existing flexion contracture. If you have someone who already has a flexion contracture, well, guess what? Chances it's gonna get worse if you don't address it seriously. Uh, also, post-trauma, they tend to have a stiffness and they also have a flexion contracture and certain neurological problems such as Parkinson's disease, because this is the position that they balance themselves on. In another word, their nerve is going to work this way, so you might, they might recur it and you have to warn the Parkinson patient that they will never walk straight. But the problem was it was uh, flexion contracture is it's, it's really uh, damaged the result, uh, your result uh, uh, significantly. So the minute the patient had a flexion contracture, his pelvic is going to be tilting uh, toward the front, and that's going to create an, uh, an array of uh, uh, kinematic uh, problem. There are studies that shows you, uh, and I think we can experience that yourself as a person. If you walk with your knee flexed, you need a lot of more energy to, to walk than if you straighten up uh, your knee. But there has been some mechanical study showing that if you have a flexion contracture of more than 15 degree, you're gonna overload uh, both limbs and your muscle are gonna contract much, much higher. So why does it happen? It's again, multiple reason as we, we said before, but uh, sometime effusion and pain start uh, muscle spasm and the patient tend to take a semi-flex position for comfort and then you have a posterior osteophyte and you have uh, capsulitis and soft tissue uh, ad adhesive capsulitis and progressive capsular contracture and ultimately hamstrings will shorten as well so that's where you where you can lead but you have to think of this pathoanatomy while you're addressing the, your flexion contracture because the chances you have to address them all and to work on them. So there are things that you can, now you have someone who, is, who will have a flexion contracture or already had it, or you have to, what I call uh, red flag certain patient for flexion contracture. And you have to warn your physiotherapist ahead of time so you have, how do I manage it? Well, there are operative and there are perioperative. Operative meaning uh, stuff that I can do during surgery, which is resection as ossified, release the contracted tissue and extra femoral cut, which I don't like, but I mention it as an option. And perioperative before surgery and after surgery, naturally aggressive physiotherapy, flag those patients for your physiotherapist and tell her, hey, this guy could have flexion contracture. You know, I really do my round usually with the physiotherapist and I pinpoint those patients and I tell her to
to be careful, you know, not to be forgiving with those that I expect to develop a flexion contracture. Bracing, uh, again, sometimes is, is an option, although post total near placement is not an easy thing to do. But the bracing is an option. Uh, and uh, preoperative bracing with dynamic braces sometimes works. Uh, I heard some people use Botox injection. Again, I don't think you never, you, you ever have to do that, but we just mention it. If there are stuff in, in severe flexion contracture, use whatever you can use. If you think bracing is gonna work before surgery, then the brace sufficient. Some, again, some of those dynamic bracing that I'm showing here, where there is a constant pressure to extend the knee is much better than rigid one. So you have to have rubber or spring mechanism to, uh, to allow to extend the, the, the knee uh, fully. But there are flexion contractures that you're not gonna be able to correct, such as the traumatic because of uh, bony malalignment. And you have always to address the other deformity that the patient has already, meaning val uh, varus or valgus, uh, and, and also the gap. So you have to think of the whole deformity, not only the flexion contracture. Uh, the degree of deformity varies. Some people said anything below 15 degree is grade one, 15 to 30 is, uh, is, is grade two, and the grade th uh, three is above 30 degree, which are the really difficult one to, uh, to manage. Surgical, uh, normally the degree of contracture will dictate your, your approach, but in severe uh, over 30 degree, you probably have to do everything. You have to uh, uh, do posteromedial corner release and you have to do also uh, some trick and you have to excise all the scar tissue and, some, and yes, a lot of time you have to use a constrained knee because after you release all the soft tissue, your knee is practically gonna be uh, unstable. So be aware of those severe flexion contracture. If you have a severe flexion contracture, please have your CCK ready or even rotating hinge because after you do extensive release, sometime you discover that you really have nothing that, that keep those bones together. But I can tell you that I have dealt with a lot of flexion contracture. You know, the deformity that is less than 50 degree, you, most likely you could do what I call the posteromedial release. Uh, and you can use even CR implants. So the mild cases less than 15 degree, uh, you can preserve even your posterior cruciate. So anything less than 15 degree, chances you will be able to do primary. You only have to focus on the posteromedial corner uh, cleaning, which I will go in detail uh, over that. But I must stress, you, you please don't release your superficial MCL because the, the minute you do that, the knee is going to be unstable and you're going to require a, a, a constrained implant. Uh, and don't try, I always stress to, 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 to the fellow under me, don't try to correct soft tissue anomaly with bone by creating another uh, bony anomaly, meaning your flexion extension gap should be balanced and you, it, it should not affect your decision how to balance the gap, the flexion contracture. In another word, don't do a lot of recut on the distal femur because you're gonna change the joint line and you're gonna be uh, in, in kind of a, a problem. So after I do the clearing of the uh, posteromedial deep MCL, then sometimes I use the anatomical tibial tray. It helps me define uh, the normal shape of the tibia. And a lot of time, there is a lot of uh, exostosis that you have to excise. And I like to cut those band. And after that, you will find a lot of a scar tissue. I'm holding here the scar tissue in the posteromedial corner. You could see me uh, holding it and cut it. This is what you have to cut. And sometimes to resect it all is not an easy thing. You keep cleaning it out and you tend up to have a new scar tissue. This is what I call the posteromedial. And, and, and in this case, you could see sometimes I, in, in mild cases like here, I cut down to the capsule and I don't excise the capsule, but I cut down to the capsule. It, it's, it's a pseudomeniscus type of a structure you will keep encountering, which is the scar tissue because of the flexion contracture. But in mild cases, most of them, you don't have to 
uh, to penetrate the capsule. Uh, but re remember, resect all those pseudo meniscus uh, structure like. Doing all of that, I'm showing you here the superficial MCL. Please feel it with your finger all the time. You can resect behind it, but don't resect near it. The minute you damage the superficial MCL, you're done. You're talking about a CCK implant. So please be careful throughout the procedure. I always feel it. You know, I sometimes tell my fellow, it's like the blind surgeon. I, they keep, uh, you know, uh, seeing uh, my, my index finger feeling the superficial MCL because the minute you resect it, you will, the medial knee will, will open up. But in a, a posterior medial corner, sometimes you have to excise the posterior medial capsule. And this is what I'm showing you here. I have reached the muscle. A lot of people are scared into going that corner. Well, they worry about the vascular structure. Yeah, but the vascular structure is really to the middle line and more, more laterally. You have to remember that there is a good muscle that can protect you from the valuable structure that you are uh, concerned about. And I have to remind, you know, and kind of uh, give a credit to the uh, sports surgeons because they are the one who suggested inflection contracture doing an excision of the posterior capsule. And this is a paper that describe it. So that's why I was more, I am becoming more and more aggressive in resecting the, the, the posterior medial uh, scar tissue. Uh, and, uh, and again, it is safe and uh, similar to do the sports surgeon, you know, the way they do it. You could see that they sometimes reach uh, the muscle and the muscle uh, protect you. So in a deformity of 15 to 30 degree, which is, uh, which is moderate, uh, you have to do posterior medial release and you have to resect the posterior capsule. You have to clean all the osteophyte like I've showed you in the video. And, and you have, there is a possibility that you have to excise the, the posterior capsule altogether. Uh, you know, I used to uh, take extra two millimeter. I don't do that anytime. But the point is in a mild deflection contracture, 15 to 30, most likely you're gonna need a P, uh, PS implant. Why? Because your, your posterior cruciate is gonna be dysfunctional with all those releases. It will be loose and, and it's better to use uh, a PS. So anything between 15 to 30 degrees, you would be safer. You sleep better if you use a PS implant. Anything less than 15 degree of flexion contracture I, I use a CR uh, and it works, it, it works uh, well. Uh, just a few points about the postromedial release. You know, release, like I said, you have to release about an inch from the edge of the tibia, uh, release just the, the deep MCL, uh, but don't go to the superficial MCL. Uh, and, and again, uh, uh, resection is not a is is not a uh, is not a good uh, is is not a good idea. Uh, so in moderate flexion contracture, do first the posterior medial release, remove all the osteophyte. If you wanna do additional, I don't do any additional uh, anymore. I really stick to balancing the gap and addressing the flexion contracture uh, separately. In severe deformity, now this is gonna be the challenging. Anything over 30 degree, I wouldn't mind even try to splint them preoperatively like it was mentioned earlier. I don't like a skeletal traction. It's too much pain, the patient don't tolerate it. I don't know how it works. I've never tried it, but I don't like it. It's just not, it's not easy to keep the patient laying down in bed and doing skeletal traction. But I have seen surgeons do it routinely in severe uh, flexion deformity, uh, but I don't. I only do extensive release. And sometimes you have to do a release of your collateral ligament and then end up using a CCK or rotating hinge. So the point is anything over 30 degree, get your CCK and rotating hinge implant because a lot of time, like in this case, yeah, I got it straight, but guess what? The, uh, the uh, collateral luggage was compromised and I have to use a CCK. If you have a bilateral flexion contracture, please do both knees together. Because if you do one and then you, you do the, wait for another two months, post-operatively, the patient is gonna develop flexion contracture. 
do them both together. I, th I think in my mind, if you have a severe flexion contracture, please do them together. Don't do them separately with an interval of two or three months. You do that, by the time you get to your second knee, the patient would have developed, uh, developed flexion contracture because one leg is short and one leg is long and the patient automatically, get, in order to match his leg lengths, he's going to bend the good knee that you, you, you spent so many time straightening up. So if I have something like that with a various deformity, I insist on the patient that I want to do both knees together. I'm not going to do one and then do the other one. And normally you could do that and you could obtain a, 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 in some of those a, a full flexion like you, you could see here. So take home message in mild cases, uh, uh, you know, you have naturally to address the varus valgus and mild meaning less than 15 degree. The, I think by removing the astrophyte and doing the postromedial release, uh, you can use a primary implant safely. And this is the majority of your flexure contracture cases. 15 to 30 degree, you have to, uh, naturally to correct the varus valgus deformity. Yes, you are gonna be aggressive more in the, in the posterior capsule. You are gonna do more, more of excision of posterior capsule and chances you're gonna uh, uh, need a posterior stabilizer. And the grade three, you have to address again the varus varus and, uh, and do posterior uh, ossified release. And you, you have to do symmetrical flexion and, and extension gap. But, but in a very severe case, you will discover that your collateral ligament has been compromised after you straightened up the leg. So you, you need more constraint uh, for those cases. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, professors. So I'm going to show the hot topics uh, for the uh, uh, total knee replacement of uh, flex and deformity knees. And uh, I want to thank my teachers, Professor Yang Liu, who have given me a lot of opportunity uh, for total knee replacement. I want to thanks to uh, jean louis Briard, who is a master, uh, who have uh, uh, taught uh, most of the uh, total knee replacement technique to me. And here I want to show some uh, hot topics of uh, uh, total knee with uh, flex and deformity. And I would like to all the speakers to join me for discussion. The first one important question is, uh, we, when we are going to do a total knee replacement of uh, flex and deformity, we need to understand why the patient has achieved the flex and deformity. Uh, maybe it's because of uh, uh, flex and deformity is caused by uh, pain relieving posture and the patient wants to relieve the pain on the knee. And uh, since the patient was uh, put in a supine position and uh, they have a posterior stenoitis, so this makes the contracture of the posterior structure. And uh, with the contracture of the uh, structure, uh, he had elongation of extension mechanism, which makes the cordyceps muscle weakness. So if we want to avoid the recurrence of uh, flexion deformity, uh, maybe we need to do release of the posterior structure during the surgery and we should try to get full extension before closing in most of our cases except for maybe rheumatoid arthritis they can get full extension after good rehabilitation and we may put the patient's knee in a splint and we need a very uh, good pain control and the cordyceps muscle chaining and uh, we, we need to pay attention to the leg length of the other knee if the patient has uh, contralateral flexion deformity, the operating knee is very likely to get uh, recurrence of flexion deformity after surgery. So I want the professor to join me for discussion. How do you avoid the recurrence of uh, flexion deformity after the surgery? I, well, I mean, the fact is that if you have corrected it on the table, it should not come back. The only concern is in if you leave flexion deformity, more so in arthritic situations like post-traumatic on the table, then you're likely to have it. And I don't think you expect it to correct if the, it's an osteoarthritic, post-traumatic osteoarthritic. Uh, inflammatory arthritis, one can slowly expect it to recover. Very rarely, we have even tried braces, we have tried turnbuckle braces, etc. 
but your best shot and best bet is only on the table so i don't think one should compromise on the correction on the table because otherwise you will be hoping more than anything else and you're going to end up as we heard before with a slightly compromised gait which not only expands more energy is not good to look at is disfiguring and leaves the patient dissatisfied yeah i agree with you we should always uh, leave the table when we can make us uh, very safe to go back to sleep if we are very concerned concerns about uh, the flexion deformity i think it's not good uh, not for us and not for the patient correct and um The, uh, the the if the patient can get the full extension right after the surgery it's not going to be a problem it's going to be it's not going to be a problem to to stay in full extension it's not going to play with the bed you know uh, trying to uh, trying to 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 break the the the, the feet of the bed uh, what we will have to uh, teach him or her is how to walk properly because if the patient has had a, a long time has had a flexion contracture during the long time they forgot on how to walk well So the, yeah. the physiotherapist uh, uh, management is uh, uh, very helpful to get them back to a more normal gait pattern because otherwise they're going to have the brain memory and the, the, the memory of the wrong gait pattern and they, it's taking time for them to do a proper strike uh, rather than a, a, a toes toes on first you have to like i mentioned earlier you have to educate your staff and tell the nurses to pay attention not to put a pillow under the knee this is a very common mistake a lot of surgeon nurses do just to make the patient more comfortable the patient who had a flexion contracture is going to feel even after surgery uh, have a tendency to to put his leg uh, in a, in a mild flexion because this is what his brain setting is even post operatively so he asked for a pillow and a lot of time the nurses will be more than generous and they would give him the pillow so again you have to educate your physiotherapist and your nurses not to put anything under the knee to the contrary to put something under the 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 calf rather than and the heel to extend the knee fully and you advise them again there are patients that i flag to my physiotherapist and if they tell me at any point that the patient is starting to develop flexion contracture sometime i would use while they're asleep the dynamic splint the dynamic splint to keep the leg extend you know extended uh, fully and you have to give them enough painkillers to, to tolerate the bracing bracing is not not comfortable after total knee placement but i have used it in 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 some cases where the patient were not cooperative in other words so i use those dynamic but i would stress on the point don't use a knee immobilizer knee immobilizer doesn't do anything you need something that has a dynamic constant uh, compression forces on the front of the knee to keep it and this is usually either a rubber band or a spring mechanism of some way on some sort and they do work really dynamic splinting really work to to keep the leg in extension yeah so i like i use this Yeah, totally agree with you. So we all agree that we should try to get extension before we close the the wound. Okay. So the grading of uh, flexion deformity, uh, we regard uh, uh, 0 to 15 grade of flexion deformity as a mild flexion and uh, 15 to 30 as medium. 30 to 60 is a severe and uh, if you have uh, over 60 degree of the flex deformity that is uh, extremely severe and that uh, you need a lot of experience to deal with this kind of situation so for mi- for mild and uh, medium flex deformity i think uh, we all know that we need uh, some uh, uh, posterior cleaning and the uh, posterior release of the capsule and uh, maybe if we after we have released all we can we need extra distal femoral resection and we are going to discuss about uh, how many extra distal femoral resection you can accept and uh, maybe uh, for some difficult cases after you have uh, cut enough from the distal femur could you possibly accept uh, cut more tibia to get full extension then you need a larger femur to fill the gap of the flexion gap and uh, do you need the posterior capsule otomy to get full extension the first We all know that um, for most of the cases with uh, flexion deformity 15 to 20 degrees 
after we clean the posterior ophthalmite and we do some release from uh, posterior femur and tibia. Uh, most of the cases we can get full extension. So here we're going to show a video of uh, posterior release. So this is a posterior femoral release. We need the uh, osteotome to stay on the bone and to protect the soft tissue. And uh, we need to cut uh, very clear to the bone, try to avoid the injury of the vessel and the nerve. So after we get enough release, uh, we will try if the knee gets full extension. And for extra femoral resection and the uh, crash angle, so we have uh, many literatures about uh, how many degrees we need to correct with how many millimeters we need to cut. In 2006, from JOA, 31 knees. Uh, the author suggests that if you cut two millimeter, you can correct the nine degree of uh, flexion deformity. Well, in 2010, also from JOA, they also said that it's one millimeter to correct 1.8 degree. In 2016, two millimeter can correct the three degree of uh, flexion deformity. And in 2019, uh, with 15 knees, uh, this is a prospective study. And uh, if you cut one millimeter from distal femur, you can correct about 2.2 degrees flexion deformity. So uh, I want to ask the question to the professors. So how many millimeters can you accept for maxi maximum distal resection? And uh, what do you think about uh, the distal cut and uh, the relation of this cut with uh, the degrees you can correct of uh, flexion deformity. So we, uh, uh, as we were discussing before, to me there's a very important landmark, which is the insertion of the medial collateral ligament, and you cannot go uh, above uh, this line, and that's really the limit. I think you have to be very progressive in your way to correct the, the uh, to, to to do the, the cut of the femur. And uh, I like this uh, uh, image of the, uh, uh, in French, we say the saucissonnage, which means that you slice uh, very thin, uh, two millimeter by two millimeter, uh, like you would cut a sausage, for example. Uh, and uh, that's um, uh, very important to be progressive because you don't want to do too much. And of course, you have to have enough. So that's why I would suggest to go very progressively. And your last and final limit is the insertion of the medial collateral ligament. I like all these biomechanical studies that you presented. They are great. It's giving us good indication. However, every case is different because there's osteophyte, there's a different soft tissue uh, uh, adhesion. And so that's why it's very hard to predict. I'm going to cut two millimeter. I'm going to gain this amount of uh, uh, degrees or this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, values of degrees because every situation is different. So to summarize, never go up to the insertion of the medial collateral ligament do progressive recut of the distal femur and you try and you see with your spacer block if you can achieve the full extension or not. Uh, so be very progressive. Very good point. Uh, narrow across the uh, uh, collateral ligament injection site. And uh, usually for a French population, uh, how many millimeters uh, on average do you uh, remove from distal part uh, maximally? So it's, it's uh, about eight millimeters. And uh, it's about eight millimeters, so you have to, eight to be careful. Eight millimeters yes. uh, uh, extra uh, resection, right? Eight millimeters of uh, extra resection. That's the maximum that you can do. And okay. you can play with your jigs, you know, okay. in the ancillary with your intra intramedular uh, femoral jig. Uh, you have the possibility to, to, to do extra uh, proximal cut of the femur, so you have to plan that a little bit in advance. Uh, and yeah. there's tips and tricks depending on your ancillary to be able to do this progressive recut that I was mentioning before. Yes, and I totally agree with you that uh, because the soft tissue of uh, each patient is different, so maybe uh, we cannot predict how many degrees we can correct with the millimeters we removed from the distal uh, femur. So uh, what's your opinion about this, uh, Dr. Maya? How many millimeters can you remove maximally from the distal femur? Well, uh, as we just heard, our normal in a normal knee is eight to 10 and add another six to eight millimeters more. Okay. So that means anything, a total of 14, 16, whatever. But definitely the cutoff point we have already heard and said, 
well away from the collateral. And even if you go too far up, the other problem is you're also going to shift the joint line severely. And then not it's not about just putting the implant into the patient. It's also about the functioning of the joint later on. And with such a way out joint line, you can have difficulty later on with the yeah. extensive. Dr. Parabici, uh, what is the maximum distal uh, femur cut would you accept if you want to correct uh, a flex deformity? Uh, four millimeter, that's it. You know, uh, the, more, the more I am more meticulous with my soft tissue, the less, you know, I really need to do recut. You know, because I don't want to, again, I don't want to correct soft tissue deformity creating another bony, uh, bony deformity in, or asymmetry in the fleshing gut. So maximum is four. And I think it has been a long time since I've done four. Yeah, I totally agree with all the view that uh, if we remove too much bone from the distal femur, we have the problem about the lifting the joint line. And we also have problem about uh, the fixation of the femur. Since this is an example of a normal Chinese male, so if we remove more than uh, 40 millimeters from the distal femur, uh, we have very few bone posteriorly to hold the femur component. So we, I think we all agree uh, in common that uh, we cannot remove uh, too much bone from the distal femur uh, for the goodness of the uh, fixation and for joint line. Maybe uh, we should do more uh, soft tissue release posteriorly, try to avoid cut too much bone from uh, distal femur. So, and we all agree that, that uh, if we uh, correct the flexion deformity all by removing distal femur, we can encounter another problem that is uh, mid uh, flexion instability. Uh, since uh, if extension, if we cut too much bone, we can get a stable extension gap and we can also get a, a stable flexion gap because uh, we do not damage the collateral ligament. But, uh, there's high possibility the patient has a mid-flexion instability after surgery. So remove too much bone from the distal femur is not a good idea. So what is the second idea about uh, remove extra tibial bone? Uh, this is also an option to get full extension. Like in this case of uh, hemophilia, uh, since the surgeon do not want to release too much soft tissue uh, because he worry about bleeding after surgery because this is a hemophilia patient. So after he removed eight extra millimeter from the distal femur, he removed the extra eight millimeter from the tibia to get full extension. But he had a problem about a flashing gap. So he used a larger femur component from size 1.5 to size 2.5. And he put the, the femur component in three degree of uh, flexion, but there's no lateral overhand. So after the surgery, you can see that the patient has, a, uh, has an okay alignment but uh, since he used a larger femoral component and there's a stretching of uh, the posterior capsule. So uh, the purpose of uh, this technique is try to get full extension, uh, correct uh, the flexion deformity. But with a larger femoral component, maybe it is uh, another difficult thing to correct uh, uh, the femoral uh, flexion uh, deformity. So what do you think, uh, what's your comment about this technique? I personally feel that uh, taking away so much, probably in my hands, I might end up using a constrained implant. Yeah. Or, a, uh, you know, because putting the normal, even a PS implant is, is very difficult to cover so much uh, both sides. And you're going to have a lot of uh, a floppy, basic kind of a situation, an unstable situation. So maybe if you have to cut so much to get, the the gap right uh, you will get a, a huge extension gap and a flexion gap you might have to consider putting in a hinged implant here yeah i, sh I share the, the same view uh, the only problem is that for a uh, hemophilic patient they are very young most of the time you operate on them uh, when they are in their 30s uh, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, very young so uh, that's the concern for the uh, for the inch implants because uh, there's very good survivorship with the rotating inch implant nowadays, but still it's not as good as a standard prosthesis. I would be concerned about uh, removing eight millimeters extra on the tibial side because we know that if we go too low, 
There's two problems. First, the problem of the medial collateral ligament, which is not competent anymore, particularly for the posterior medial uh, collateral, for, for the posterior medial part of the uh, medial collateral ligament. And second, for the fixation, because if you go too too low, uh, the, the fixation on the tibial side is not as good. Um, so that's the concern. So I wouldn't go too far. And um, uh, the hemophilic patients are, are very challenging. And uh, once again, it's a very good example of going progressively. So instead of recutting eight millimeter on the tibial side, I would do exactly the same that what I was saying for the femur. So basically you do thin slices of two millimeter, two millimeter up to reaching your point. And if you see that you can't get this symmetry of the gaps, then you have to go for a more constrained implant. Proximal tibia never, because and the problem with removing extra bone of the, of the tibia is gonna affect your extension and flexion gap. And in another word, it doesn't give you any benefit with bone cut. So I would never uh, address the tibia, leave the tibia alone. You know, you, you can do in, in the femur because in the tibia, you cut it, uh, you cut in, you cut a two millimeter, yes, but you're gonna have a two millimeter looser flexion gap as well. So you're not gaining, you're kind of cheating yourself. If, if I saying I'm got a full extension, but I now have more unstable flexion gap. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think uh, with well medical treatments of uh, nephilio hemophilia, I think you should not worry too much about uh, soft tissue release. You can treat the, uh, this kind of patient like uh, the normal uh, flexion deformity. So I agree with you that uh, if we encounter this situation, uh, uh, a CCK or maybe a more constrained knee, maybe a better solution uh, for this patient. So uh, extra tibial cut may be an option, but not uh, a very good option. And uh, I want to discuss about uh, posterior release. We all know that for uh, patients with severe uh, flexion contracture, and uh, we need to release the posterior soft tissue. There is a white curtain contained by the semi-member gnosis uh, and the ca posterior capsule and uh, all the tendons posteriorly. So during the surgery, if we cannot get um, full extension, the same gap like a flexion gap, we may need uh, the insole technique, which is uh, cutting the posterior capsule, uh, making a capsular otomy or maybe a capsular sectomy. So this is a video uh, about uh, a patient with uh, 30 degrees of uh, flexion deformity during the surgery. We can see that uh, after the marrow bone cut, and uh, we have uh, a nearly normal flexion gap. We can feel the tension of the gap, it is okay. And uh, there is uh, no opening medial and laterally, but in extension, we have about 25 to 30 degree of uh, uh, flexion deformity. So we do not want to remove too much bone uh, distally. So we do a posterior release uh, with the insole technique. The difference is that we put it in the 90 degree to release, and uh, we very carefully we made the capsule otomy, and uh, we use uh, the fat as a barrier between the posterior capsule and the vessels and the nerves. But when we are doing this procedure, we need to be very carefully and not to injure the uh, posterior posterior important structures. And we, we need to cut all the white curtains open. Sometimes we use uh, the scissors and uh, we just uh, try to find the white curtain very carefully and open it with the scissor. So after the procedure uh, capsular otomy, uh, we trial with our component to see if we can get full extension. So this is the same size of the poly. And very easily we can get full extension of the knee. So uh, after we do capsulotomy, I think we can get about 25 to 30 degree of uh, flexion correction. So what's your opinion about uh, capsulotomy or maybe capsulostectomy? No. Uh the first of all for for uh, uh, not too much of a deformity we tend to reflect the capsule from the back of the femur 
for that you can use a curved osteotome and often what we and not a sharp one and we take a gauze piece and sort of gently tap it and lift it off 10 15 degrees easily get straightened i agree that posterior coaxillotomy is a well established procedure it can be done in many ways what we do is we go slightly more distal towards the tibia when we make this release but if you are cautious and you are well away from the uh, neurovascular structures it is a well accepted uh, norm but once you have corrected it we don't immediately keep it in that position for too long and uh, once again rarely if we have corrected like this we will be we will cement both the sides separately leave the knee in about 10 15 degrees flexion post op on a pillow for a couple of days and then gradually just straighten it with we don't even need for that a brace or anything but yes i agree this is a procedure which can be relied on up to 30 for 30 to 40 degrees yeah so uh over 40 degrees of uh, flexion deformity you think uh, you uh, may need a capsule ultimate right that is after you have removed all the other obstructions all like yeah. bites and things like that Yeah, of course, of course. And uh, Dr. Uh, Parrot, uh, so what is your opinion about uh, uh, posterior capsule ultimate? Do you use the, this technique to do uh, uh, medium or severe uh, flexion deformity? Not exactly like you described. Uh, I'm I'm staying um, exactly like it has been described just before, very close to the bone, and I like to start on the femoral side. And yes, if I need to go uh, more, I will do the same thing on the tibial side. And there's very often some osteophyte at the posterior medial aspect of the tibia that we don't uh, uh, often remove, but it's helping a lot for the reduction of the flexion contracture as well. So I like to bring my tibia anteriorly. I like to break break this uh, posterior the posterior osteophyte. And if I need, I will go down. But Uh, I, I am um, very cautious about the capsulotomy as described by Insol. It's a very nice technique, but I think it's uh, you have to be very careful uh, and remember the the distance of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, the nerve at the posterior lateral aspect is less than five millimeter. Uh, so you have to be very very cautious when you're playing with your bobby, when you're playing with your uh, ciseau as well, and uh, staying close to the bone, both on the femoral side, and tibial side. For me, is safer. Yeah, I agree with all of you that uh, we should use uh, capsule ultimate for only severe flexion deformity, and uh, you must do it uh, after you have fully uh, uh, released from the on the bone of the of the posterior capsule. And I think this is very rare procedure uh, we may need uh, in our clinical experience. So uh, I think uh, there are other techniques maybe uh, we need to mention uh, for the audience to know about it. Uh, although maybe they do not need to do it, but I think it's a good thing for them to know about uh, uh, all the techniques for to deal with the severe flexion deformity, uh, such as uh, stage surgery. Uh, for example, we release posteriorly uh, of, uh, on the first surgery, and we will do a total knee replacement on the second surgery. Or for CCK or hinged knee, uh, it could be possibly be used uh, to make you safely uh, go down the uh, operating table. And uh, do you ever use the uh, retraction technique uh, preoperatively or maybe postoperatively uh, to correct uh, flexion deformity? And the final one is uh, femoral skeletonization. So uh, I heard the two-stage surgery from uh, uh, one teacher from Hong Kong, uh, that is uh, Peter Chu. Uh, he once told us about uh, two-stage surgery. The first stage, he would do a posterior, uh, uh, posterior incision uh, for release. Then after the patient had got uh, fully knee extension, he will do uh, the anterior uh, incision to do a total knee replacement. I want to hear uh, your opinion about uh, this technique. Thank you. Now, first thing, let me just point out: this incision in your diagram should not be the incision at the back of the knee. It should be yeah. more of a leg. In case some youngsters are going to be shown this, otherwise it can form a very painful scar. Like this is uh, we grew up in an era where we had a lot of polio surgeries for residual polio paralysis, so we were comfortable in doing this kind of a release of the hamstrings, etc., simply to correct the knee and then to give a brace, and that was either for uh, increasing the you know making the leg straight, or if the quadriceps was strong enough, patient could walk better uh, with a lighter brace. however in in this particular circumstance now it has been a very very long time that we have gone in to do a two stage 
we, with all the newer equipment all the newer understanding of uh, the biomechanics and uh, with all type of implants we are now uh, doing a one stage we are not doing a two stage i have uh, no experience of the uh, the two stages and uh, i am a i'm a big fan of the skeletization when i know that it's not going to be possible otherwise so basically that's when uh, you have been trying everything uh, with the conventional technique and the conventional implants so you have to be ready for this type of surgery and once again it's not a surgery that i would recommend for uh, people uh, without any experience in revision knee surgery or without having any experience in complex uh, uh, cases. So I, I, am a, I don't know if you want to talk about the skeletization now or later, but the two stage have, have absolutely no experience. Yeah, for me also, I have no experience or me, I have no, not even seen a live surgery of a two stage uh, uh, re releasing. So I want to skip this technique to the next one. So CCK uh, is a uh, uh, very safe for young surgeons who have uh, done uh, flexion deformity with uh, very few uh, uh, experience and it is, it is uh, can avoid uh, the patient to have a dislocation or other complications in uh, flexion and sometimes for difficult cases with uh, flexion deformity fixed uh, flexion deformities and the severe virus and uh, maybe after the, all the soft tissue release we need uh, we may need a hinge knee to be prepared uh, for the surgery and uh, uh, I want to ask you your opinion about uh, preoperative rejection. This case is uh, from uh, one of my close friends uh, from uh, uh, Hunan, China. And this patient uh, uh, is a young patient with uh, about uh, 110 degree of flexion deformity on bilateral knees. So he had an extra external fixation, uh, try to gradually extend the knee before he going to give the patient a tonal replacement. So you can see from the video, she has never been walking uh, like this um, for the first part of uh, her life. So uh, what's your opinion about uh, for difficult flexion cases? Do we ever use uh, preoperative rejection uh, to correct some degree of the flexion deformity? Thank you. We no longer uh, believe that simply traction is going to do any good. Yeah. And the only thing that the traction does is it reduces the degrees uh, to some extent of the flexion contracture or flexion position, not contracture, of the flexion attitude that improves is only the attitude which is due to the spasm. It is not due to any contracture or the bony thing. So the traction nowadays is not part of our armamentarium. Now, if you look at this particular thing, I need to caution you. Yes, you can certainly, if you are straightening like this and then getting the person to use his own knee and use it, that's one thing. If you are using an artificial knee, then it's a totally different ball game. In this case, please be careful after correcting. You must observe that in these developmental situations, because of the deformity, the lower femur is bent on itself. It's, it's not the lower end of femur is not looking to the ground. The lower end of femur starts looking backwards. And yeah. that, that is the distal femur, not the posterior femur. So when that happens and when you are putting an implant later, thinking that the leg is now straight, you might put the implant in a very bad position. So in which case, I do not have experience with putting these uh, kind of frames, elizor of type of, or whatever frames these are called, but this kind of frames to straighten knees and do knee replacement, I, nor, uh, uh, I, I would be very wary of doing this kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. I, would, I haven't done it, but I would seriously think of correcting the deformity at the lower end of the femur. Because you are correcting the soft tissue deformity. In a developmental situation, you also end up with bony deformity. But this is what I have thought now. This is not what I have been able to practice yet. Okay. Thank you for your opinion about this, uh, Dr. Maya. I think also this is a quite uh, uh, difficult. It's an amazing case for me. And uh, I think uh, the patient, although the patient is satisfied with the result, maybe she did not need a... Uh, uh, a very a very near a total knee replacement uh, for her knees. I think maybe he can do this uh, training for a while and maybe uh, need a retreatment uh, in the later. So uh, any comment uh, for this case, uh, Dr. Parrot? Yeah, I think uh, uh, what has been uh, said by Dr. Maria is very important. Uh, yeah. uh, we have to correct the deformity where the deformity is. And if you look at this very young patient with this uh, uh, flex uh, uh, femur, uh, she might potentially be a candidate for an osteotomy. 
And if you put a frame, put a frame to treat the bone as well, not only the soft tissue, because we know that with this uh, modern, the modern ones, you can uh, correct uh, the deformity uh, uh, with the x -fix, uh, and with excellent results when it's a complex deformity. Draw Palais in uh, Baltimore uh, presented that uh, very nicely, and there's a, a whole book on the correction of the uh, deformity of the limb. It's a beautiful book. I recommend uh, you to read it. You're going to learn a lot. And so uh, if you correct the deformity, correct it all. Second point is that I would never do a total knee arthroplasty right after this type of treatment because there's, during this correction, there's always, always some skin problems, some skin reactions, some uh, uh, colonization with the staph, uh, with the bacteria around here. So if you put a knee arthroplasty on a young patient after this type of treatment, you have a super high risk of infection, which is a drama for the person. So leave enough time in between the two treatment. And if you do your first stage well, correct all the deformity, they might not even need a, a, a knee arthroplasty before a while, you know. So because these patients are very low demand patient, and as, as long as you can put them uh, up, they're already almost happy. And last point, don't forget the modern way of treating spasticity, which is the Botox. And uh, 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 toxin botulinic has, has been uh, uh, proven a lot for these things uh, that you can associate with pie crust of the armstring and pie crust of the posterior uh, medial or lateral structure. And the combination of both is working uh, beautifully. And uh, um, I, I have experience from my father who is uh, uh, treating all these cases and all this uh, spasticity for the kids with a, a birth problem. And uh, the, the, the results are just incredible. Okay, great, great. It's uh, also a great opinion. So you do the pie crusting uh, when doing a uh, same stage uh, osteotomy, uh, intra uh, articulate or maybe extra articulate from uh, outside, the pie crusting. Yeah, you can combine. Uh, it's, uh, so you do a needle uh, pie crusting of the tendon, and uh, it's actually uh, uh, very impressive on how much you can gain uh, without doing much. And it's uh, used for the Dupuytren disease as well. Uh, it's a tr transcutaneous uh, uh, pie crust. This technique is well known from all the orthopedic uh, surgeons of the world, and you can use it for the hamstring. You can use it everywhere, basically. And it's sometimes very helpful for these uh, complex deformities. And it's a very minimally invasive treatment. There's almost no risk. Uh, so um, it's very helpful as well. Okay, it's a very good point. So I'm going to move to the next case. It's also, uh, uh, if we cannot do, if we are not going to do a preoperative retraction because uh, it takes too long time, hospitalization. So sometimes we, uh, we do postoperative retraction for the patient if uh, we cannot fully correct the deformity during the surgery. So uh, for this patient, uh, he had a 70 degree of flexion deformity. We do um, posterior capsule otomy and uh, we, uh, we cannot do too much uh, uh, distal uh, femur re recutting because uh, it's very small bone. So we gave uh, one week of uh, uh, retraction after surgery, so the, it correct about 20 to 30 degree of uh, deformity after surgery. So uh, that is one of the things we use uh, postoperatively. So uh, I think we all agree that uh, uh, for residue def flexion deformity after surgery, it is uh, not acceptable. Although some uh, authors uh, have uh, literature uh, that saying that uh, residue flexion will decrease uh, with time after very good rehabilitation, but I think we all agree that uh, we should try to get full extension on the table. And uh, uh, for technique of uh, skeletonization, uh, for some severe uh, flexion deformity combined with uh, virus deformity or valgus deformity, sometimes we need a skeletonization uh, to get a fully release of the soft tissue. And uh, most of the time, we need a more constrained knee, like a CCK or maybe a hinge knee to do this. I, I want to show you some cases, and uh, uh, I would like to hear your comment about these cases. This is my own case of patient with flexion deformity and uh, valgus knee. So I do um, a parallel nerve release uh, before the surgery, uh, before the bone cut, and I do uh, lateral condylar uh, skeletonization. Uh, but I have to use uh, CCK processes to keep uh, the stability. So after surgery, the patient can get uh, full extension, and he, uh, she can uh, get full, full with bearing of the right knee, and the range of motion is uh, acceptable. So uh, this is another case of a fuse uh, flexion deformity. Uh, this is a post-traumatic knee. 
So the patient, uh, I cannot get uh, uh, well known to the joint line, so I do a preoperative PSI instrument. During surgery, I, I use this instrument to try to help me to find the distal femur cut and uh, the proximal tibial cut. And after two cuts, I can get the joint line, so I do pussy release, and uh, I want to correct uh, patella baja and also uh, a good exposure of the knee. So I fixed it with uh, wares, and uh, I have to use uh, uh, CCK, uh, try to get uh, 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 stability of the knee. So the patient can get full extension after surgery, but uh, he can get only 70 degree of flexion. Uh, he is uh, okay with uh, this result. And this case is from uh, Jean-Louis Briard. Uh, he, he had a, a female case of a bilateral 90 degree of flexion deformity for many years. So during surgery, uh, he do a uh, femoral uh, skeletonization and uh, elevate our, the insertion site of the MCL and LCL. And after surgery, uh, he use uh, a CCK processes and try to fix the bilateral ligaments. And the patient can get nearly full extension and over 90 degrees of uh, flexion. So uh, I would like to hear your uh, precious opinion about uh, skeletonization of the femur. Do you ever use this technique uh, for some tough cases? Or what is the pitfalls and good points of uh, this technique? Thank you. Skeletalization is excellent, and, uh, but it doesn't always mean that you need to denude everything every time. As we heard, it again needs that selective salami slicing kind of a thing, start releasing it slowly and we often, I don't like sharp this thing. I often try to use uh, some kind of a swab or, you know, and trying to push the soft tissues, reflect them off slowly from the bone. And uh, also I, I have been using, since I have had the privilege of uh, assisting Professor Briard a couple of times, he's a, he's a fond visitor of India and uh, on a couple of instances when he came and I enjoyed the lateral osteotomy that he does, though to be very honest, we haven't done too many of those, but I found that they work well. And I do think that this is a good, I, and if you remember the presentation which I made in the fused knee, I did show you how the entire soft tissue sleeve I had, it's like creating a sleeve all around. So in a nutshell, yes, it is a useful adjunct to the entire armamentarium when you're doing these kind of difficult surgeries and it can be trusted with minimal complications. So uh, what uh, if you do you are doing a femoral skeletonization? What do you do with uh, the soft tissue that you have been released from the femur? Do you want to fix it or just uh, use a CCK or hinge to protect it? No, the ideal thing will be to use take a bit of bone sliver with it, because to get the soft tissue to come back and fix and do the heavy work which these ligaments are expected to do, will not be possible by simply reflecting the whole soft tissue. On the other hand, if you have done it or it has happened or you don't know or you're not familiar with the taking the bone slivers on the sides, then you will have to use a constraint kind of an implant. CCK alone may not do the job if both sides are affected. It can only work at the most if one medial side usually is not functional. Okay, so you will prefer a hinge knee for uh, after a skeletonization, right? Yes, if, uh, if you're confident enough, as I said, theoretically, but yes, usually if we have reflected everything, then we would like to keep a hinged knee. Okay, and uh, Dr. Parrot, uh, what's your opinion about this? Yeah, I, I share the same opinion and I've learned uh, to do this skeletization with my uh, former mentor, Professor Obanyak, and uh, uh, we were really uh, taking the whole entire femur out using an extensive subvastus approach and not the minimally invasive one, the, the extensive one. And uh, it's working very well, can get an access to the femur that is incredible. And um, uh, when you have a, a problem of flexion as well, releasing or cutting the medial collateral ligament is what is opening you the knee completely. And when you have a difficult access to your knee, that's the only way to get this. And it's very true in revision as well. So uh, I, I, one point about the, so that's for the approach. One point about the uh, constraint. You have to know that if you have a, a, a big asymmetry between the extension and the flexion space, a CCK type of implant is not enough. And you have to go for a hinge. And I'm even stricter than you. Uh, for me, if the medial collateral ligament is not functional anymore, I will go for a hinge. Because it's better to have a hinge lasting 15 years than a CCK instable that you have to revise after one year.
So we shouldn't be too afraid of a, a rotating hinge arthroplasty. If it's well implanted, it's working great. And there's not much wear, there's not much loosening, less than we think. So would you like to use a skeletonization for flex and deformity alone? Or would you like to use it for combined flex and deformity with severe valgus or varus? I used it a lot for revision cases and uh, uh, I will use it for flexion and extension contracture. And if I know that I won't be able to get the space that I need to get with the uh, salami technique, then I will uh, make sure that everything is ready, that I have the RHK implant ready and I will go for the skeletization. So basically it's going to be a, a much uh, related to my approach. If I can't get access to the knee, uh, I, I, I might need uh, to go for the skeletization and that's uh, also the plan for the uh, uh, revision cases. Yeah, I need to clarify something. I totally agree and uh, that's perfectly right that we would only use a CCK for a medial collateral damage if we have uh, otherwise the balance all right. But if we have a floppy situation where we, we cannot, with the CCK, get stability, that is only a varus valgus thing. So yes, I agree with Professor Barrett, Barrett that this is the way to do it. And uh, also we will use uh, the principle of skeletalization is applicable to any of the situations where you have sort of a floppy knee and you need to get stability, but that will come with the implant. This yeah. will give you movement to prevent damage to the nerve and other neurovascular structures at the back. But uh, otherwise, you have to, like in the talk which I gave, I wrote very boldly in red that whenever you go for these surgeries, be prepared for a hinge or revision-like situation. You don't go confidently to do a primary knee or a CCK alone. Okay. So another topic about this. So when you are using a CCK, if you think a CCK is enough for the stability of unbalanced gap. Do you always repair the, you know, the, the loosened side of uh, the collateral ligament? Uh, for example, severe valgus knee and you think a CCK is okay. Would you like to strengthen the MCL? There is absolutely, if it depends, is it a laxity only or has it been cut or has it been abulsed? There are three different situations here. If it has been cut in the middle, then psychological happiness of putting two sutures can be, you know, it perhaps doesn't stay that way, but you can put a couple of sutures, it's fresh cut. On the other hand, if it is a fresh avulsion, then there is no harm in putting it back with a couple of screws with the washers with claws on them, those the specific washers or with uh, staples, there is no harm at all. So the, in addition to the CCK, there is no harm in stabilizing these with the help uh, which provides additional stability and keep these in a brace for at least six weeks post-operatively to make sure they don't have any unusual virus or valgus strain which can evolve these. So this can provide some more stability. How much? It's difficult because we haven't gone back to see these, what happens in the end. Okay, Dr. Tarabici, so uh, have you ever used uh, this technique, uh, skeletonization on the, or maybe what's your opinion about this? Thank you. I haven't used the traction. I think uh, traction might be beneficial in certain condition where the adhesion hasn't been so such a long uh, way. In another word, if I have someone who had severe flexion and contracture for years, I don't, I don't think the traction will do anything. Someone like a rheumatoid patient who developed it recently, traction might make a, might, might help you significantly. So I don't use it for all. I haven't used it at all, to be honest with you. And, and for severe flexion deformity, do you use uh, insole capsule automy to uh, cut a posterior wet curtain open, uh, try to get more uh, extension gap? I am a firm believer that this your surgical intervention is going to be the key issue in any flexion contraction and you really got to get it straight get it balanced uh, so uh, uh, i am uh, i am as you may probably know that i am kind of a sometimes i do extensive soft tissue release you have to because you have to really remove all the scar tissue and the soft fight if you want to call it the, the contracted tissue so 
uh, I think the, the treatment for flexion and contracture is really mainly surgical, uh, especially for the very old one. Okay, so we move uh, next cases. Uh, maybe the last one, extra throat deformity. There are very rare uh, occasions for post-traumatic uh, flexion deformity. There sometimes you need to use uh, osteotomy to correct uh, extra throat deformity, uh, try to decrease uh, the flexion deformity. But sometimes you are lucky that uh, the deformity is not severe or maybe you do not meant, you do not want to correct uh, this deformity. So you try to balance the knee uh, with your bone cut, I mean, you, maybe you put your uh, uh, prosthesis component uh, in a very uncommon position, but just to try to um, make the patient uh, very good uh, early function uh, without too much uh, uh, surgical procedures. And this case is also from uh, Jean Louis Briat. You see, this is. Uh, patient of flexion deformity with uh, extra arterial deformity. So uh, he did not want to correct it uh, with osteotomy. So he do a uh, soft tissue balance and the bone cut. And uh, this is a 10 year follow up. The patient still uh, have got a good range of motion and uh, very good function. Uh, so do you ever use, uh, mm, so what, what's your opinion about uh, flexion deformity caused by uh, trauma? Uh, uh, is lead to uh, extra articular deformity. So what's your opinion about this? So if the extra articular deformity, uh, I strictly believe if your center of rotation is falling outside the bone or there is such a severe deformity, I would like to correct it, the bony correction and then put the implant close to the normal situation rather than put the implant in an unusual position and hope for the best. I, I would go for that, correct the uh, deformity. So we move to complications. And uh, we have mentioned that uh, maybe paranoid nerve injury, vessel injury will be the important complication that we need to pay attention to when we are creating the uh, flexion deformity. So I do agree that uh, uh, severe valgus knee maybe uh, is a, uh, a situation uh, more easy to get uh, paranoid nerve injury. So flexion deformity, maybe you do not uh, uh, need to release the paranoid nerve, right? And this is uh, for uh, blood vessel, blood vessel uh, complications. And uh, I think uh, I do not want to show you uh, uh, the take home messages uh, for the uh, internet audience, uh, because uh, for the, all the tough techniques we have discussed uh, today, uh, it is a very rare uh, situation. Most of the time, 95% of the time, we can get uh, flexion deformity corrected. With, uh, uh, with uh, cleaning and with a uh, soft tissue release. And uh, very rarely we need uh, this femoral cut or maybe posterior capsulotomy. So uh, I think uh, 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 today we have a uh, uh, discussion about uh, flexion deformity from all the uh, experienced surgeons. And uh, I think for our young surgeons, you will learn a lot uh, from today's uh, discussion and also from the PPTs uh, from Dr. Maya and uh, all, the, all the professors. So uh, before we are uh, closing, I want to thank all the three professors who participated in this discussion and I hope to uh, see you in the future uh, uh, for more meetings. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.